sound of the shofar since its first piercing blast blown by a heavenly being on Mount Sinai. For almost 1,600 years, the sound of the shofar was heard every Friday afternoon to call the people of Israel to worship on the Sabbath. And I have blown the shofar just now to call spiritual Israel, the elders of spiritual Israel, to focus upon the Sabbath and God's special meaning of this day. It seems like only yesterday that I was sitting in a cafeteria at a college on the West Coast and I saw this worker who was washing, wiping the tables in the cafeteria and she was so beautiful. It was love at first sight <laughs> for me. <laughs> And I was very shy. But I figured, you know, if I sat here long enough at this table, she'll have to come to my table. (laughs) And so I sat there until she came. And the rest is history. We fell in love. I still remember my freshman year in college, Rick, and who was it was especially talking about Greek? Who was talking about the, where they learned Greek? I think it was John talking about learning Greek from... Um, anyway, I still have a hard time remembering vocabulary words for those languages. I'm not a natural linguist. And so at that campus, I drove a riding lawnmower. And I got pretty good at it. You know, I could, with one hand, flip the lawnmower around the palm trees one palm tree to another one, and it was quite an art form that I had developed. I became so confident on the lawnmower that I could multitask. And so I had little three-by-five cards that I would write Hebrew vocabulary or, and Greek, voc- basically Greek vocabulary words that time. I'd look down and learn a Greek vocabulary word and then do a few more swings around the palm trees and then another Greek vocabulary word. But then I fell in love. And you know what? I still had to learn those vocabulary words, but more often than not, on my three-by-five cards were words to love songs that I was learning to sing to my beloved. Because when you fall in love, life becomes a song. And you want to share that song with your beloved. Now, I tried writing my own love songs. I have not a poetic bone in my body. (laughs) And so the love song that I wrote was my best, but she was a music major. (laughs) I really wanted to impress her. I don't know why I chose music to try to do it. I bought a guitar and I learned three chords on the guitar, three minor chords for this song. And I sang it with all my heart. But even after the first stanza, I knew it was a dismal failure. (laughs) And so I painfully moved through the rest of the song, and she said how wonderful it was. And I knew it was a flop. And I have never written her a poem since. I, I I could not bear to put her through the torture that I put her through those minutes. Have you fallen in love with God? Do you have a love song to sing to your beloved God? Some of you are like me. You don't know how to write love songs. You know what? God's taken care of that. In the middle of the Bible, he's written a special love song for the Sabbath. Just for us. To sing back to him. And in this Sabbath, Psalm, Psalm 92, we have, I believe, the entire theology of the Sabbath 
all summarized in one psalm. God said, you want me to break it down for you? What the Sabbath's all about? Here, I'll even put it in poetry so you can learn it as a song to sing back to me. And so he's put into this wonderful book, the Bible, just one song about the Sabbath. It's the only one we have. But he inspired the psalmist to put it all, all the meaning, all the message, all the motivations, all the mood, everything you need to know about the Sabbath in this one psalm. It starts out, a psalm, a song for the Sabbath day. Psalm 92. It is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your love in the morning and your faithfulness every night. You see, it's a love song. Singing of God's faithful love that He has for us. Would you like To have your love for God grow stronger? Would you like for your understanding of the meaning of the Sabbath to grow deeper? Then I commend to you Psalm 92. And in the next few minutes, I would like to open up this psalm for us so that we can see how it has it all. It has not only the mood that our our experience should take while we're experiencing the Sabbath, But it also has the four motivations for the Sabbath. Because, you know, you can have the best customs and traditions that if you just do them by rote, they'll become meaningless. They'll just be going through the forms. When I fell in love with Joanne, I wanted to sing to her love songs. And it wasn't something that I was forced to do. It came naturally out of a heart that was in love. And when we got married, I couldn't wait a whole year to celebrate our first anniversary. And so I invented what I know many of the rest of you invented, but I don't want to know that you invented it. I want to think that I invented it, so don't tell me. (laughs) Joanne and I invented month anniversaries. And on the 28th of every month is our special day where we celebrate our love. Now, God loved us so much, He couldn't wait even a month. And so He invented week week anniversaries. And we call them Sabbaths. But there are 24 golden hours every week that He has begun. Not at midnight, when most of us are conked out. He, he starts it right when the sun goes down, where there's the glories of the sunset, when it's a mood for love. It's where lovers go out on piers and points to say words of love to each other. And God says, that's the time I'm going to start this day as an all-day date with you. And so God's week of anniversary in my view, are God's inviting us into intimacy with Him for 24 hours. So now let's go and see how we can spend this time according to this great love song. This psalm is a beautiful psalm. It is so exquisitely done that we could spend the whole time just talking about its literary artistry. It also has the thumbprint of the Sabbath on it. If you're going to choose a number that you would highlight to say Sabbath, what number would you choose? Seven, right? It's the seventh day. And God has put his sabbatic thumbprint throughout this psalm. The psalm has seven stanzas. It has The name Yahweh, the name for God's personal name, seven times throughout the psalm. It has seven descriptions of the righteous and seven descriptions of the wicked. Sevens are everywhere in the psalm. If you didn't even have the superscription, when you say, what's going on? Everything is sevens. 
And then when you read the superscription, of course, because it's about the Sabbath. And so he puts his very DNA in the psalm, even if you would lose the title of the psalm. But we can't go further into those, uh, into those literary qualities. What I will point out is that there are seven stanzas, and in the, and in the middle, the, there are actually seven, uh, I should say, seven sections in the psalm. And there are seven, uh, five stanzas, and the middle one is divided into three. So you have one, two, and then three, four, five, and then six, seven. So you have seven sections, but each one of those uh, is part of one of five sections. Do I make myself clear? Let me, make, let me try it again. Every three verses of the psalm is a different section of the psalm. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 13, 14, 15, five sections. But the middle one, verses um, 7, 8, and 9, are divided clearly into three parts. So you divide those into three and you get seven, a total of seven, right? So what I want us to do is look at each of these five parts and we'll see how God unfolds this glorious theology of the Sabbath in poetic form, in aesthetic form. So first we read the, the stanzas, the uh, first three verses, and we find a description of the mood of the Sabbath. If you talk to teenagers, they say the mood of the Sabbath is boring. I would like to suggest the antidote to that is reading Psalms 1 to th- verses 1 to 3 of Psalm 92. As I read these three verses, you tell me what mood comes out from these verses. I've already read verse 1, but let's do it again. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your love in the morning, your faithfulness every night, on an instrument of ten strings, on the loop, lute, and on the harp, with harmonious sound. What is it? What's the mood? Praise, thanksgiving, worship, love, joy, yes, enthusiasm. Anything but boring. If you want a picture of what God wants your Sabbath worship service to look like in your church, this is it. He wants it to look this way. If it looks boring, you've missed it. And God is calling you to a higher view of the the experience of the Sabbath that He wants to have happen in our churches on Sabbath morning. But again... You can't just make it happen. You can't force it. The joy comes being in love when you spend time with your lover. And when you focus upon the qualities of your beloved. And so the rest of the psalm is giving us four reasons for being joyful And having the Sabbath be this mood of celebration and joy and praise. Four motivations, four reasons. And you'll notice that every one of them is not focused on you and me. It's focused on Him. The Sabbath is all about Him. It's a gift of Him as He comes and fills the day with His presence. And as we focus upon these four aspects of His character that are highlighted by the Sabbath... If you do that, I guarantee you, you'll fall in love with Him. And the more you'll fall in love with Him, the more you'll be joyful. It comes irrepressibly. You can't stop it. You can't help it. So you don't go there and try to do things to manipulate your congregation to have this kind of experience. You go there to uplift God and to show Him as the one behind all of these Sabbaths experiences and then invites your congregation and you do it yourself, your family to spend that time and I guarantee you your life will be never the same and the more you do it, the more it will be not the same as you will come closer and closer to your beloved. So let's look at these four ways that God has embedded in the psalm that we can experience this 
effervescent joy that's described in the first three verses. Okay, so let me read the, um, the next three verses and tell me what part of God's character is being highlighted here. What part of His being or His work or His character? Verses 4 through 6. Now notice it starts with the word for or because. So, first three verses, it's good to sing joy, joyously to God and to praise Him and to love Him and to talk about His love and faithfulness because now He's giving you the four reasons, the four motivations for having that kind of an experience. So, the next four are the practical steps for how we can get to that Sabbath experience and not just get there, but, it, but have it in our very DNA. Okay, so verse 4. For you, Lord, have made me glad through your work. I will triumph in the works of your hands. That word for triumph can also be translated, will ring out with shouts of joy in the works of your hands. Oh, Lord, how great are your works. Your thoughts are very deep. Senseless man does not know, nor does the fool understand this. What's the emphasis? God's works, and what, is this refer- what are the works referring to? Just exactly. In the book of Psalms, where you find God's works, or His handiwork, He's talking about His creation. And so the first motivation to Sabbath joy is to think that God is our Creator. The Sabbath is a memorial of creation. Now this is the poetic way of saying it. Where do we go back in Scripture to find Theologically, or a, a text where he didactically uh, teaches us this, that he, it's the Sabbath of Memorial of Creation. Where is that? The Ten Commandments, exactly. Or Genesis chapter 2. Genesis 2, first three verses. Exodus 20, verses 8 to 11. For in six days the Lord created the heavens and the earth. Therefore, keep the Sabbath. So, it's rooted in creation. Now, was the period of creation, the the six days of creation, was it a time of joy for God? Prove prove it to me. How do you know that? All right. He says, wow, it's good. So you know he was pleased. What else do you find? Very good. All right. So it's Tov Ma'od even there in the text. Not just Tov. Yes. Now, don't think just Genesis 1. Where else do we have stories of creation, the creation account in another place? In poetry. Stay Old Testament. I'm an Old Testament teacher, but I'll I'll let those verses come as later commentary. But uh, Job, yes, so go to Job 38. Longest speech of the Bible. God's longest speech. Four chapters. And it's all about creation. As he's telling Job, you know, all those suffering things that are coming upon you. I'm not, I can't give you the explanation of the great controversy right now, but trust me, because I'm your creator. And I'll be able to take care of your problems, just as I've got the power to take care of creation. But right in the heart of this, in Job 38, he says in verse 4, Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me, if you have understand it, who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? To what were its foundations fastened? Or who had laid its cornerstone? And then verse 7 gives us the mood. When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God did what? Shouted for joy. Hey! You could see those sons of God just, just pumped by they saw the awesome work that God was doing. It was a joyful time for the whole universe. Was it a joyful time for God? Is there a text that shows us that? Explicitly. Yes. Proverbs chapter 8. Go to Proverbs chapter 8. It's the third creation account of the Bible. We read about wisdom, which is really a a way of personifying Christ here, who is working with the Father. And we read verses 22 to 31, the story of creation. And we go down, I'll pick it up in verse 30. Then I, wisdom, Jesus, was beside him as a master craftsman. This is Proverbs 8, 30. I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing 
in his inhabited world. And my delight was with the sons of men. Do you notice how this is even framed? you got two words that are repeated twice. Rejoicing. Rejoicing. I'm sorry. Delight. Rejoicing. Rejoicing. Delight. A, B, B, A pattern. A beautiful pattern. But it's got four words for joy. This was what was going on in the mind and the heart of God as they were fellowshipping with one another in their creative work. And so, I urge us. The Sabbath is a day for connecting with God, our Creator. You guys who live around here, you're so lucky. Don't do what so many people do that live close to beautiful things. They never go and see them. You know, people who live nearest the most beautiful, spectacular sites, you talk to the locals there, oh, I've never been there. It's 10 miles away, you know, or 15 miles away. You're surrounded by the Appalachians. You're surrounded not far from the ocean and all kinds of beautiful places around here that you know far better than I do. Capitalize on it. Let your churches be occasions where, as you know already, but link it explicitly with Psalm 92. Link it explicitly why we want to continue to have our love for God enhanced. Therefore, come on on the hike. See the handiwork of God and rejoice in all that He's done. So, first reason for Sabbath joy God is my creator. Let's move to the second reason. Back to Psalm 92. Verse 7. When the wicked sprang up like grass, when all the workers of iniquity flourished, it was that they might be destroyed forever. But you, Lord, are on high forevermore. For behold, your enemies, O Lord, behold, your enemies shall perish. All the workers of iniquity shall be scattered. Now, what you have to do when you read these words to get the mood, to get the part of God's character that's being referred to, is what we call comparing Scripture with Scripture. You go back and look at these phrases, workers of iniquity or wicked spring up like grass. And you know where the, almost all of these are clustered? They're clustered in the description of Israel's deliverance from Egypt at the time of the Exodus. And their deliverance from the Canaanites at the time of the conquest of Canaan. It is language of being redeemed from our enemies. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. So this verse is highlighting God is my Redeemer. He's the one that has saved me from my sins, saved me from my enemies. He's delivered me from evil. He's delivered me through, the, through His grace. God's my Redeemer. In the, in the middle verse of this entire psalm, verse 8, it, it stands alone. All the other verses have poetic partners because most of Hebrew is written with pairs. A line and then another line that's a pair. But this has no pair stands all by itself, right at the pinnacle. It's like the high point of the whole psalm where it says, but you, Lord, are on high forevermore. You see, that's what the Sabbath's all about. It's lifting up God, this wonderful God who made us and who redeemed us. Now, where do you go in the explicit descriptions of the Sabbath that links the Sabbath to redemption? We went to Exodus 20, linked it with creation, where does it link it with redemption? Okay, it's there in the Gospels. but Exactly, Deuteronomy 5. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, Moses repeats the Ten Commandments. He's reciting it to them. But when he comes to the Fourth Commandment, in Deuteronomy 5, notice what he says is the reason to keep the Sabbath. Uh, verse 14 Deuteronomy 5.14, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord God. He goes on and quotes that almost verbatim as Exodus 20, but then it says, verse 15, and remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt and the Lord your God brought you out there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. 
Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. And we were going quickly during the first uh, hour and I mistakenly said that the first mention of the Sabbath as a noun was Exodus 20. No, it was in actually Exodus 16 when he gave the manna. And as a verb, you find it already in Exodus 5 where apparently Moses, when he came back to Egypt, was instituting Sabbath reform. And so Pharaoh, when he talks to Moses in Exodus 5, if you read it in the Hebrew, it says Moses is saying, Moses, you are causing them to Shabbat. You're making them rest. And it uses the word Shabbat, Sabbath. And Moses was, was fomenting Sabbath rest. And Pharaoh was furious at that because there was being a Sabbath reform that was going on. And when God delivered them from Egypt, he then said, for this reason, as well as creation, I want you to keep the Sabbath because I am your Redeemer. And I repeat what I said uh, last hour, that God created His beautiful handiwork and then He rested on the seventh day. He said, it is finished. And He hung on the cross and he bowed his head just before he died. He cried out, It is finished. And rested in the tomb on the Sabbath. And ever since, we have the privilege of telling, in the, telling the world that we believe in the resurrected Jesus who is our righteousness because he rested so that we can rest in his finished work. The Sabbath takes you to the heart of redemption and salvation. It is the sign of righteousness by faith. The rest of grace that we find in Him. So the Sabbath is the day for focusing upon God and His redemptive work. Not only in the past, but you notice verse 9 says, For behold, your enemies shall perish. All the workers of iniquity shall be scattered. It looks to the future. And it's the promise that God will redeem us from our enemies at the end of time, too. And we know how the Sabbath becomes the sign, the sign of true allegiance to God. And the enemies are those that have rejected this sign. And God is calling us to trust on Him who is the one who delivers in the past from the guilt of sin, in the present, from the presence of sin, I'm sorry, from the power of sin, and in the future from the very presence of sin as we are glorified and we head to eternity. And so this redemptive motion goes all the way through. So the Sabbath, my friends, is a time of joy. Why? Because He's our Creator and He's our Redeemer. Let's move to the next verses. To verses 10 through 12. But my horn you have exalted like a wild ox. I have been anointed with fresh oil. My eye also has seen my desire on my enemies. My ears hear my desire on the wicked who rise up against me. The righteous sprout like a palm tree and grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Here are all these images and it now shifts from the past to the present, to the present experience of sanctification, of growth in intimacy with Him. And so it uses the illustration of the horn. The shofar is not just a horn to blow. It was also used in ancient times. They didn't cut off this end. They just took a ramrod and cleaned out the marrow inside and it became the anointing instrument, filling it with fresh olive oil and pouring on the wounds of the sheep or physicians would pour using olive oil mixed with the balm of Gilead to bring healing to people's sores. And this is like telling us uh, I have been anointed with fresh oil. Do you get bruises? in your workplace during the week? 
do you elders get yelled at sometimes because you didn't do this right or you forgot to be there at the right time or you dropped the ball somewhere? Or even aside from your elders' responsibilities, we all get bruised. We get cut during the week. Cutting words, cutting acts, disappointments and sorrows. And God says, you know what? You come to church and just just focus on me. Just imagine me pouring that oil onto your, onto your wound. I've got the balm of Gilead for the sin-sick soul to pour on the spiritual wounds. And not only that, but this oil is poured from a horn. And a horn is a symbol of strength. And so the verse says, My horn you have exalted like a wild ox. You've seen the horn of the of the ibex or the wild goat or the wild ox. It's still there down in the wilderness of Judea. You can see flocks of these wild oxen or, or ibexes that are jumping agilely from one cliff to another. You walk into the into the wilderness of Ein Gedi, and you can some of you have been there and you, you look up on the cliffs. 200, 300 foot cliffs. Impossible. Any human could get there. And there on a little ledge is an ibex. And then there's another little ledge 10 feet away with a big chasm in between. And with just one little whoop, and he's over there. You know? And he's just leaping from one rock to another with, with all the strength bulging from his muscles and yet the agility and grace. Can you translate that into the Christian life? We're all clumsy. We're all awkward. We're all fumbling. We're all stumbling. And God says, I want to exalt you like that wild unicorn in the King James. Like that wild ibex with spiritual agility. Spiritual strength. Spiritual ability to endure and to prosper. God says, that's what the Sabbath is about. Spend time with me as your sanctifier. Now, where in Scripture do you find the Sabbath specifically linked to sanctification? All right, in Ezekiel chapter 20. But I think it's, I, I go, Ezekiel is actually quoting from Exodus chapter 31. Where we read, verse 13, Exodus 31, 13, Speak also to the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbath you shall keep, for it is a sign between you, me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. So, the experience of sanctification, according to Exodus 30 and verse 13, 31, 13, is something that the Sabbath offers to give it. Give us. Now back to Psalm 92. That's not the only picture he gives of the sanctifying experience. You go to Psalm 92, and you find he says also, The righteous flourish like a palm tree. Some of my most memorable times in Israel was traveling to desert oases. You go down to where it's sand all around and then you come to this oasis. Uh, like when you come from Egypt and you travel up through the Wadi Faran, you come to this 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 Wadi, this desert, uh, Resedim, the ancient place of Resedim. And here are all these palm trees just growing right out of the sand. And there on the palm trees, it's loaded with fruit. And you read the descriptions of these palm trees, of what they grow in, in Israel, or you can go to the deserts of Southern California and find the same thing, these date palms. They grow up to 600 pounds, each tree. 600 pounds of luscious, fresh dates. They're wonderful. And those trees don't have to try to produce the dates. The trees... Simply make sure that their roots go down in the water, deep in the aquifers, and that their leaves are re receiving the sun of righteousness, and the dates come naturally. 
Our task is to, in the Sabbath, and as the Sabbath spills out into the rest of the week, put our roots deep into the water of life, Jesus. And reflect the Son of Righteousness as He shines on us through His Word. And then, let yourself grow. The fruits. Fruits are not something you try to do. You are, they're the result. They're the result of the root being there in Jesus. The fruits come naturally. That doesn't mean there's no work involved, but it comes spontaneously. It's something you want to give. And so, God's telling you, the Sabbath is the time for you to put your roots deep in the sanctifier. And He's promising those fruits of the Christian life will grow ever more precious on the tree of your life. And then finally, the last illustration of this section, He will grow like a cedar in Lebanon. There's one place in the Middle East that I haven't yet gotten to go, and that is to Lebanon. I want to see those cedars. I lecture about the sanctuary built out of cedars, cedar wood that's shipped down from Lebanon from from King of Tyre, but I haven't laid eyes on the cedars of Lebanon. I've seen them in pictures. Anybody here seen the cedars of Lebanon? All right, I'm, I'm envious of you. I need to talk to you afterwards about what your experiences were. But I understand there are not that many left, unfortunately. They've, a lot of them have been decimated. But the cedars are, are much like our, our, um, our sequoias out on the West Coast. Uh, next week, Next week, I'll be climbing among the sequoias of uh, Sequoia National Park. I, I'm supposed to preach there, and I, I'm playing hooky for a day. I'm not going back to school. <laughs> I'm going to spend a day hiking among the sequoias to, in, to boost my spiritual battery from the, from the beauties. But these sequoias, these cedars, they have a special bark, special rosin in their, in their outer layers that are impervious to insects, impervious to decay. So they have a natural protection from the enemy that would destroy them. So these trees, that's why they, they grow hundreds of feet high. Nothing can kill them except for the axe of the, of the woodsman. God says to us, I want your life to be that way. I want you to be surrounded by my spiritual rosin so that when the enemy comes in and tries to attack you, he'll spit it out. This doesn't taste good. I can't get in here. And he wants to give you the elegance and the erect stature and the nobility of those wonderful cedars of Lebanon. Now at Andrews, I was so happy the day that they planted a tree right outside my office uh, our Andrews University is a natural arboretum uh, located on the national map of arboretums. And we didn't have a cedar tree, cedar of Lebanon tree. So right outside my office, they planted a cedar of Lebanon. I was so happy because I might not ever get to Lebanon. Who knows? But I had a tree. But that winter, it was a terrible winter, and the tree died. It never got fully established. So I still don't have a cedar of Lebanon anywhere close. So I'm waiting, waiting for that tree. But in the meantime, I want the spiritual, the spiritual truth of this cedar of Lebanon to be part of my life. So help me here. I'm a teacher, so I've got to ask for you to help me review three motivations for Sabbath joy so far. We look at God as our Creator, as our Redeemer, and our sanctifier. But there's one more. It's saved for the last stanza. That last stanza tells us, it actually shifts to the present, the future now. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bear fruit in old age. They shall be fresh and flourishing. I'll stop there. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord. Here's the help. Here's where to read it in the original adds a little, a little touch of nuance, which is very important. This word does not mean planted only. It's a special kind of planted. It means transplanted. Chateau. It's the word for transplanted. 
Now, you who are gardeners, you know the difference between planting something and transplanting something. I plant the things that I know I can't kill that will come up. But I'm a, I have a terrible green thumb. And so the things that I know I can't grow from seeds because they'll never come up for me. I go to the nursery and I transplant. When they're already healthy, I transplant them to the exact place where I will know they will grow the best. We're all planted. We're planted into our church, into Christ. We have a heavenly plant. Someday God's going to give us the heavenly transplant. And in the Psalms, this word transplant is a word that's used for glorification, for taking us to heaven. And so God's going to take us wherever we are. We're in some pretty rough soil right now, some pretty rugged places. But one day he's going to take us all and do that heavenly transplant. And he's going to transplant us where? In the courts of our God. Now you wonder, how, do, how, how can we be growing in the courts of our God? But you know, you go back to Ezekiel chapter 28, and the sanctuary is described as a garden. Now there may be buildings, but me as the outdoor guy, I know. And it's also on the mountain of the Lord. So there's going to be a big mountain. You need to change your picture if you just see a, a, a golden city. You can have, I'm sure there will be some gold parts to the city if you're a city person. But me, I'm going to spend my time out on that mountain, on the mountain in the garden of the Lord, being transplanted to the garden of the Lord where I will flourish and I will still bear fruit in old age. This didn't mean much to me back when I was 20. <laughs> But I read this with greater sense of joy now than ever. I'm still going to be fresh and flourishing for eternity. The Sabbath is a, is a hope of glorification. My father-in-law, who just died recently, he was, he was a real role model for me. I love to hear him pray at the end of every Sabbath. He would pray, thank you, God, that we're one Sabbath closer. Every Sabbath is a little taste of heaven. It can be. God wants us to, with His grace, make it that. So that we can taste a little of the heavenly manna. Every Sabbath. A little taste of glorification. And as people come to our churches and see the joyous Sabbath that takes place there or in our homes on Sabbath, they'll say, what's going on here? And we can say... It's just a little taste of heaven because we believe in the Sabbath. And the Sabbath is just a little piece of the hereafter where we will, from one Sabbath to another, come and worship Him for eternity. So what's it all about, brothers and sisters? If I had to summarize it all in one, one verse, it would be the way that Psalm 92 summarizes it. In verse 15. What's it all about? The psalmist says, it is to declare that the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there's no unrighteousness in Him. That's our God. He is upright. This word can be literally translated, He is straight arrow. You can depend upon Him. That He he shoots straight. He's not devious. And he's our rock. We can stand firm upon him. And there's no unrighteousness. And this is, again, a special word for unrighteousness that means no injustice in him. Remember, Satan charged God with not being fair. And Satan's been trying to perpetuate that lie throughout history. And finally, the Sabbath that we celebrate in eternity will be a demonstration that God was purely fair. And every Sabbath we'll sing, Just and true are your ways, O King of Saints. So, brothers and sisters, I'd like to call for a Sabbath revolution in the Potomac Conference. And I'd like to ask you to come and to be the catalysts of that revolution. To decide as good as Sabbath may have been in your life, that you're going to make it even better. By God's grace, 
you're going to have in each church and in each home riding high Sabbath as Isaiah 58. Riding on the high places of the earth. And the great thing about God, He doesn't say, here's how to do it. You just follow my little cookie cutter. No, He says, the sky's the limit. I've planned the time. I've given you these 24 golden hours. Now, go out there. Listen to my spirit. Listen to the people. Listen to what they need. And help to shape a Sabbath experience that will remind them, help me again, that God is our Creator, our Redeemer, our Sanctifier, and our Glorifier. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Lord, I thank you for this message in the psalm, especially for those of us that don't know how to write love songs. You've put this love song for us to sing to you. Some of us can't even sing very well, but you told us we can sing it by our lives. You told us that the, the song of the redeemed of the 144,000 is a, is a new song that is the song of their experience. And so I pray, Lord, that the love song for the Sabbath that we talked about today can be an experience in each one of our hearts as elders of this church. And as that love song wells up within our heart for you, help us to know how to share it, how to facilitate that others can receive it, that we can lift you up as our great God the Lord of the Sabbath. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We have time for a few questions. There's supposed to be a question and answer period. And we have time just for uh, maybe 10 minutes. Uh, They think they want us down there at 1230, I understand. Okay. Okay, thank you. All right. So, um, if we don't have any questions, we can go right now. But if you have some questions, let me tell you, first of all, if I don't have a PowerPoint on this, but I have written a book called Love Song for the Sabbath. And it was written some years ago. It went out of print, and there was a request for it to come back in print, and so it's come back in print. It's just a little paperback, but it has all of these texts, but it also has my own experience woven in it, in, and it has the Sabbath customs that we did last night describe and so you can just go to the ABC and just ask for love song for the Sabbath and what's that I don't think it's on Kindle yet no but uh, if they don't happen to have it just remind them that they have a policy that they can you can order and they will order and special print it even if they need to uh, because it's it's got a standing a standing and if they refuse to do that then you just write me at Davidson dot Andrews edu and I will remind them of their agreement to do this so uh, it's it should be something you can you can uh, perhaps find helpful any any questions you might have of things we said last night or now yes okay I did how did you get <laughs> Yes, it, it, it <laughs> true confession. Yes, yeah. It, I when they asked me to write part of the Psalms, I only wrote about a fifth of the Psalms. I said, "Please give me the first forty-one, first forty-one Psalms and Psalm ninety-two." And so they gave me that one. You're right. So you can find the basic outline of what I've given here, and the chiastic structure and everything in the study Andrew's study Bible. Okay. Yes. Nothing's way off. No. It is a power. It is powerful. That's right. Yes. Thank you for bringing us to that Colossians text. I really w- wanted to get back to that, and I forgot. So thank you for bringing us back. Yeah. 
No, no, no. I just, I didn't say it because I didn't know there was good creation, but I, I, you would want me to stay in the Old Testament, wouldn't you, not to go to the New? You know, <laughs> we, 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 had this, we had this little uh, friendly rivalry at Andrews. My, when I was department chair of the Old Testament department, Ivan Blazin was department chair of the New Testament department. So we used to tease each other about which part of the Bible was more important, you know. And so one day I came out of, I came out of my office and I was just sort of paging through the Bible and I said, you know, Ivan, what do you study in those few pages before the maps? You know? <laughs> and and he, used, he usually has a comeback, you know, immediately. Well, he didn't have one, but I, so I knew I was going to get it. So the next day he came out of his office and he was paging through the Bible and he says, man, the Bible's got such a long introduction. <laughs> So, he got me. <laughs> but we, uh, we both believe both Testaments. Yeah. 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 No. That's right. But, but Paul says it so well in Colossians. I agree. So, thank you for doing that. Yes. Sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, those are good questions. Um, my wife is actually the one who teaches the theology of the Sabbath in the, at the seminary. And she has a wonderful sermon about uh, Sabbath for, for teenagers. What to do on Sabbath afternoon. She spends a lot about things to do in nature, but she also talks about uh, uh, getting to your whole idea of of. Sabbath as a time for, for service that then spills out into the whole rest of the week. And for me, the best text on that is Isaiah 58, because Isaiah 58 gives us a model, not just for what to do on Sabbath, but what to do on the Yom Kippur Sabbath, because we are now living in this antitypical day of atonement. And so you want to know how to really fast on Sabbath? Is it not to do your bread to the hungry and to do all of these things? And if we would more intentionally link that, well, this is Sabbath stuff. This is Sabbath which is spilled out into the whole rest of the week. Sabbath, we get to do it all day long, but we need to live that, we, we get the privilege of living that spiritual Sabbath-ness throughout the rest of the week, too. Yeah. Did you want to have a... Like, like, you know, in our culture, I've grown up in it. Yeah. No, those are, that calls for a, another sermon, which I, I know you're preaching, and continue it. So, yeah, yeah, good. Yes.
right. I agree with you totally. And just to add on to that, Isaiah, 5, Isaiah 58 mentions the blowing of the shofar, and it mentions fasting, and it mentions afflicting of soul. Those two things only happen on the Day of Atonement. And so the whole Sabbath chapter is about Sabbath observance in the Day of Atonement, which is what we're living in now. So it's of particular relevance to what should be our attitude seven days a week climaxing on Sabbath. And uh, so I'm so thankful you've been emphasizing that. I hope Travis is, and you have put together these sermons and you need to make a little booklet, book, preach it, preach it and share it. So, yes. Yes, that's right. It is the same word. Uh, it is Shabbat, which means to cease or to rest, and these were high Sabbaths. They weren't the weekly Sabbath, but they were high Sabbaths. And Leviticus 23 shows the distinction between the two. Leviticus 23, the first two verses, these are the Sabbaths, these are the, the uh, festivals of the Lord, which you shall keep as a, as a convocation. And then it, gar- it mentions the seventh day Sabbath. Then in the next verse, it gives another introduction. It says, these are the feasts of the Lord using the same language. And then it mentions the rest of the festivals. But it divides it in in two sections. They're both Sabbath rests. But then when you get to verses 37 and 38, it says that the annual ones are connected to sacrifices. They are special times of rest in order to offer up the sacrificial system. So they're linked together with the ceremonial law. And then it says, besides the Sabbath of the Lord, that's the weekly Sabbath, and that's not linked with the ceremonial law. And so, right there in Leviticus 23, it, even though it uses the same word, Shabbat, or Shabbaton, uh, a, a holy Sabbath of rest, it gives you the context to show that the, these other Sabbaths came out from the Sabbath principle, but they were part of the ceremonial law pointing forward to Jesus. And, though, and there, so there's a distinction made between the two kinds of Sabbath. Sure. Well, it's a, it's it's because the word means the word mean, means rest. Rest. Yeah, they were they were days. That's right. So we use we use holidays. Think of the word holiday. We use holidays when we put sacred holidays and we put secular holidays, but we still use the same word. So that's why they add, they want to say weekly Sabbath, it adds the Sabbath of the Lord. Then it then that means the weekly one. They want to say the other one, then they link it with the, the annual festivals with another term. So uh, it's 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 with like that with a number of words. They have a secular, I mean, not a secular, but they have a, a specific meaning for a, 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 a local, local Sabbath day and then for the others. There was one hand over here. Let me. Okay. Um, the word there, the word there for feast, is, is simply chag, which means a, a festival. So it could be a Sabbath festival. It's normally used for Passover. It's it's the special word for Passover and for Feast of Pentecost and for Feast of Tabernacles. Those are the three words that are called chag. Yeah, that's right. So. Well, I, I think Sabbath is here, but I don't think it's that word. Here's why. Because if you read down to verse 4, verse 5, then the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people from their work 
And Pharaoh said, look, the people of the land are many, and now you make them Shabbat. Now it uses the word Shabbat from their labor. So Moses is already causing them to keep the Sabbath. Even if they're rebelling, even if they're resisting their officers, they're saying, no, we won't work on this day. It's Sabbath. So it, it wouldn't make a lot of sense for Moses to say, let's go out so that we can keep a feast, Sabbath, if they're already keeping the feast, Sabbath. So that's why I think it's two different things. Yes. 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 I've often wondered if it included Psalm 92. Yes. Yes. Yeah, it, it, it's a hint from Psalm 92. Yeah, why not? Yes, yes. It's uh, It also alludes back to the Song of the Exodus, you know, the Song of Moses. So it has some words from there. But I think you're right. It has some words from here, too. It's going to be a special song just for us. So I like to put it this way. It's the Song of Moses, which they sang. And then it, the second stanza is the Song of the Lamb. And that's going to put in all the part about the Messiah and about our experience. And so uh, it's going to be a beautiful song. We don't know the exact the full song. We just have a taste of it here. Okay, one more, one more hand, or a couple, couple more. Yes, go ahead. You are not. And if I were preaching my first sermon on which day should you keep, I would preach that part of Hebrews 4. It's there, definitely. This word, sabbatismos, is a, is a noun which means the keeping of the Sabbath. And so I, I'm not taking away from that at all. But I'm simply elaborating on it. And we, we read in, in Hebrews chapter 4 a little bit earlier... Um, verse 4, for he spoke a certain day, way, place of the seventh day. In this way, God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And then he mingles it with Joshua. There's the new Joshua here. And so he says, for if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not after have spoken another day. So then, therefore, there remains a keeping of the Sabbath for the people of God. But now verse 10 then unpacks that and says, for he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. So the implication of it is righteousness by faith. That it's a sign. It's an outward sign. Our keeping the Sabbath is an outward sign that we have ceased from trying to work our way to heaven. So it's not an either or. It's a both and. Very much. Yes. There is a hand here. Yes. Yes, yes. I can give you lessons. It's all right. <laughs> okay. Right, right. Yeah, Tura, Shivarim, and the uh, and the Terua. Yeah. And I do. I have. I have. A, I won't fit in my suitcase, so I can't bring it. I have one that's this long. That's totally un, un, unpolished. It's just fresh off the horn. And then there's uh, some shorter one like this. And then I've got one that's a straight one, which is the Ibex. And then you got the antelope one. I say I have I have shofars in every room of my house. So <laughs> it's always ready to blow wherever I am at. Yeah. So okay, I think it's. Time, you'll be the last question, and then we'll have our prayer, and we can head to lunch.
Yes, he said to the people, be ready for the third day. Do not come near your wives. I will be happy to answer. This is a, why not make this the climax of our discussion on the Sabbath? Yes. Is sex okay on Sabbath? <laughs> and my answer is a resounding yes. And let me explain very briefly. When you come to Genesis 2, God makes the Sabbath holy. How? By His presence. Right? When you come to the end of Sabbath, of chapter 2, God presides over the first wedding. He is the one who is the officiant at the first wedding. If God is present at that first wedding, is it holy? So if the Sabbath is holy and the marriage is holy, do they belong together? Now, just a pu- not just the punchline for this. When did God perform the first wedding? What time? What week? What week? What day of the week? On Friday. Just before sundown. And so their wedding night, when you go to the Torah... And the wedding night is when you consummate the marriage and you bring out the sheets the next day to show that you truly are married was Friday night. God ordained that the first sexual activity would take place on Sabbath. And so when I go to Exodus 19, it's interesting and there's a new study that's just come out on this. I'll be happy to give you the reference for it. And the study shows that this is not talking about sexual activity at all. It's using the word for not touching in the sense of a person having menstrual uncleanness. And a woman in her menstrual cycle, a man was not supposed to touch her or else he would be ceremonially defiled and he couldn't go into the sanctuary. And so God is saying, just in case your wife may be having her menstruation at that time, Don't touch any woman because, you know, you might touch someone and then you find that she's already started her period and she hasn't known it yet. And so he is preserving them for ceremonial purity as they're heading up to the sanctuary sanctuary of his temple, coming to worship. And all of those ceremonial laws are no longer enforced. Those were part of the ceremonial system which had to do with the ceremonies at the sanctuary. And we don't we don't tell people if you're if you're in your menstrual period, don't come to church. Because that's not that's passed away with the ceremonial law. And so, if my mother-in-law, who was a marriage and sex therapist, she put it this way one time. <laughs> when someone asked her, when someone said, oh, I could never have sex on Sabbath. Well, first of all, she said, well, what do you do when you have sex? Just describe it a little bit. She says, well, the first thing I do is there's a picture of Jesus on the wall. And I go over and I pull the shade down so Jesus can't see <laughs> And so, and, and so she said, I could never have sex on Sabbath. And so she said to her, you know, if you, sh- if you don't have sex on Sabbath, the kind of sex you're having you shouldn't have on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday either. You're missing the whole point of the sexual relationship as showing us a window into intimacy with God. We're as close as we can come to one another. And then in the arms of my beloved I think of how wonderful it is that God holds us in His arms. If you're not doing it for that reason, you shouldn't be doing it at all. But if we understand the beauty of sexuality, it belongs with the Sabbath. Now, I don't go preaching if you don't have sex on Sabbath, you're a sinner. I leave it freedom. (laughs) But I do tell at the seminary, when I first went to the seminary, I dared to preach as a young teacher on Song of Songs. And I happen to mention in chapel that in the Song of Songs, it's, uh, I mean in the Jewish tradition, if a person is a seminary student in the Jewish tradition, he is expected to have sex with his wife on Sabbath. That's expected. That's part of your curriculum, the seminary curriculum. And right after the sermon, the dean, who was very old school, found me up in the third floor and pushed me against the wall and said, 
Don't you know that the Bible says you should not do your own pleasure on my holy day? And I didn't preach again for 10 years at the seminary. But just this last year, I, I finally got to preach another sermon. And I preached on the Song of Songs. And I said the same thing as I did before, but there was a new dean. And when I said what I said this time, the new dean said, Amen, brother. <laughs> All right.